Amen. All right, so keep your place there in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, of course, a um, great chapter on faith, a great chapter talking a lot about faith and, you know, what comes from faith and the examples of, you know, the fathers in the Old Testament of their faith and also Sarah, there's, some, there's a woman in there as well. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 pretty much destroys, you know, this idea that, you know, um, if you do the right things in your life and you have faith and you go to church and you give money to this church and all this, that just your life is just going to go great. You know, I guess this is what a lot of people, uh, a lot of big churches will preach this. You know, they'll preach the prosperity gospel, that all you have to do is just come here and do everything I say and just listen to me and God's just going to make you successful and he's going to just, you know, you're going to find your purpose and your business will grow and all this kind of stuff. Hebrews chapter 11 pretty much destroys, you know, the prosperity gospel. Amen. You know, it's not untrue that, you know, you'll receive blessings in your life, but what I want to do tonight is I want to look at Hebrews chapter 11, and I want to talk about tonight the blessings that you may not see. The blessings that you may not see. Our verse of the week is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 13, where the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So talking about, you know, these men and women in the Old Testament that, you know, they died in faith and they didn't receive those things that they had faith in, that they had, you know, those promises were not necessarily made, they were made to them, but they didn't receive the fulfillment of that promise, okay? So let's just go through Hebrews chapter 11 and look at some things and see how we can apply that to us tonight and see what that means for us. You say, well, you're going you're to give me a sermon tonight on how I'm not going to be blessed in my life? Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, and I'm going to show you, though, the, the, what, what's better. What's better than things that you can receive in this life. Because, look, God always has something better. Okay, God's not going to say the prosperity gospel is too simple. It's too simple. It's, it's not, God's better than that. You know, he can give you more than that. Okay, so let's look down at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1, and hopefully, you know, I can get this across to you tonight, and uh, it, it may sound confusing right now, but hopefully um, we can look into this in depth and you'll see what I'm talking about. Hebrews chapter 11, let's look at faith, first of all. Verse number 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And I'm not going to preach on it tonight. But I, I had to take that whole section out because I just started writing a sermon on that verse. And when I was, when I was doing that, I love that verse. There's a lot there. I'll preach a sermon on just that verse sometime soon. Okay, But look. Look at the first part of Hebrews chapter 3, and where the Bible says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke the world into existence. We already know this. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. Things which are seen were made by the word of God. They were framed. We believe that by faith. Amen. We were not there to see it happen. Right? Well, you're looking at it, you're like, maybe you were. No, I wasn't. Okay, I was not there to see it happen. But it's not, look, it's not blind faith. Okay, we weren't there to see it happen. It's things not seen, but there is evidence. There is evidence. In verse number three, you know, it says they were framed by the Word of God. We, don't we have the Word of God? Don't we have the Word of God? So the world was framed by the Word of God, which we have in our hands, right? We have the Word of God. The Bible's never been proven wrong on anything, from science to physics to, you know, medicine. The Bible's never been proven wrong. Ever. It's, as a matter of fact, it's modern technology and man's understanding of things that is constantly trying to catch up to the Bible. Amen. And I've gone through many examples of that. All right? But it's faith all the same. Okay? We weren't there to see you know, the world created. It's, it's things not seen. Faith is things not seen, something we can hope for. That's faith. Okay? Faith is not just your salvation, you know, but it's for our life on this earth as well. Okay, because there's more for us. Look, 
There's more for you than just your blessings on this earth that God will give you. All right? There are blessings that you and me and we may not see and we may not personally realize on this earth. And that's what Hebrews 11 talks a lot about. So let, let's look at, first let's look at some men in Hebrews chapter 11 and women who had faith in things that they did not receive. Okay? The title of the sermon tonight is The Blessings That You May Not See. The Blessings That You May Not See. But I'll explain to you tonight on how, even though you won't receive those blessings, there's something better. There's something better for you. Look down at Hebrews 11 and verse number 4. Let's start with Abel. The first example. By faith, Abel offered. So we know that faith is things hoped for, things not seen. Right? So when it says Abel had faith, these were things that he had hoped for that he didn't, he didn't see. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So what does that mean? That means that Abel brought the right sacrifice. He brought you know, a blood sacrifice, a, a sacrifice to God that God wanted, and Cain, of course, brought, you know, the fruits of his labor and, and things that were not, you know, meat, basically. And Abel received that, and it says, it says, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So what God gave Abel was he received, he wrote his testimony in the Bible, is basically what that says. Okay, look at verse number five. We'll see somebody else. So we see that Abel's testimony, because of his faith, God wrote his testimony for us is what the Bible says here. Look at Enoch. It says, By faith Enoch was translated that she sh he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So Enoch didn't receive this blessing until the very time of his departure from this earth. Okay. Look at verse number 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. So Noah's faith, by Noah's faith, God gave him a vision of things to come, and then he blessed the generations of his family by saving them as well. But that was not yet realized. And so God's judgment was not yet realized. And then the, Noah himself didn't realize the blessings on his family. Okay, look at verse number 8. This is a big one. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he, he obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. That means he didn't know where he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city with hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now that's a big one. This is basically saying that Abraham was promised this land, this promised land. And he never realized it. What Abraham did was he wandered in strange lands. I mean, think about it. I mean, we read through the Bible, and it's just a few pages, and then Abraham's gone, and then we're into somebody else, and then pretty soon they're in the promised land, if you're reading through your Bible. But think about it. Abraham, who lived and was given the promise, never received that promise. You know, he received some promises, but he didn't receive that promise in his lifetime of that promised land that he was going to, he was going to get. Think about it. Abraham to David, we just, we just studied this in Matthew chapter 1, 14 generations. You know, it was like five, six hundred years from Abraham to Moses before they stepped into that promised land. So that, that promise wasn't fulfilled anywhere near Abraham's life, or Isaac's life, or Jacob's life. Think about it. So he didn't realize it. He did not realize that promise himself. But by faith, he, he did it anyway. He, did, he went where he was supposed to go anyway. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 11. Here we see Sarah. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So she had, the Bible says here, it says she had faith that God would deliver this promise. 
In verse number 12, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Look, did, did she receive that promise in her lifetime? Was Isaac as the, the sand on the seashore himself? Was he like the stars of the sky? No, he wasn't. The, those promises were fulfilled generations and generations after Sarah. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there's many blessings that these people, these people in the Old Testament that the Bible is talking to us here in Hebrews chapter 11, that they were promised that they did not receive in their life. But they, they still had faith. By faith, they received those things, but they personally did not receive them. Okay, so you say, well, what's the, what's the application? Well, the application is this. First of all, the prosperity gospel is not true basically because of this, you know, this chapter in the Bible. All right? And many other places in the Bible. But this pretty much blows away this idea that just whatever you do in this life for the Lord is just going to be paid back to you in this lifetime, to you personally. No. That's not going... If you, if you look, if you're, looking, if you're expecting that, you're going to be disappointed. So I'm telling you so you're not disappointed. There's blessings that are going to come elsewhere. And later. Okay, so look. Maybe, you know, some, maybe most of the blessings that you, that will come from your faith will not be realized by you. Yeah. Think of it. Think of the prophets. I mean, think of the prophets as you read through the Old Testament. Think of Jeremiah. I mean, the guy's constantly being rejected. I mean, did, I mean, did, did anyone listen to him one time? I, I don't think anyone even listened to Jeremiah even one time. I mean, they're constantly just being, he's just being rejected, rejected, they're being killed. Look at verse number 37 of Hebrews 11. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. You know that most people, most historians think that that was Isaiah. That was sawn asunder, and that's who that was talking. I mean, we don't know, it's not in the Bible. But most secular historians believe that when it talks about being sawn asunder, it's talking about what happened to the prophet Isaiah. I mean, that's not a great life. I mean, you know the story of, of most of the apostles and many martyrs throughout history. Look, many of them didn't re receive any blessings in their lifetime. Okay, look down at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 32. I mean, any of the prophets for that matter. It's very hard to find something good having, happening to a prophet in the Bible. All right, look at verse number 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of, of Gideon, and of Barak, and Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of, weaknesses were, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And the others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and the mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Look, the Bible says that the, that the world was not worthy to have these men. It says that, that the world did not deserve these men. And, it, and look, at all the, look at what they got in their life. And they received not the promise. So they didn't get the blessings in their life. It was all future blessings for many, from these men. So, how do we apply Hebrews chapter 11 to us, is the question. What blessings might be received by others when we're gone? Well, let's just look down at, at, you know, let's use Abel as an example. His testimony. So, your testimony. That's, that's a blessing that people in this world will receive 
when you're gone. Your testimony will be a powerful force for those who come after you. I mean, your testimony is powerful for the people that are around you now. But your testimony is super valuable to those who will come after you. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Actually, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll just read you 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 8. The Bible says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So your life is a testimony. Your life is a testimony to those now and to those who will come after you, to those that you're raising. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. The Bible says this, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Your conversation is a testimony to people. Amen. When you speak, and you speak of the things of God, that's a testimony to people. So look, you should strive to have a good testimony. As in 1 Peter chapter 3, it's a view... Look. It's a view of your heart to other people, your testimony. It's how people can see your heart for those who come after. And you know what that will turn into? That'll turn into the second application tonight. That will turn into blessings on future generations. And that is Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11. Think of it. Abraham really, you know, received none of the promises of that land. None of it. Not even a little bit. He wandered in strange places. You know, if you ever, you know, look, if you ever feel out of place in this world, just think of Abraham. Just think of how he must have felt. As a Bible-believing, separated Christian, you know, there, is going, there are going to be times where you feel like a stranger. And, and that is okay. Look, that's the importance of church and fellowship. Especially in times like this. You, you probably feel more like a stranger now. But in times like this, that's the importance of church and fellowship. You're going to feel like a stranger to this world, but not to us, right? Amen. Not to us. It will, you know, we will strengthen you. We will edify you. In times like this especially, turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, or just look at your bulletin. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. We know that but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. They had faith in them, see? Even though they didn't even receive them. They had faith in them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Look, they all felt like this. They all felt like you feel. So you feel like, man, I, I just, I'm so different than everybody else. I'm so different. My beliefs are so different than the way everybody else is doing everything. I don't have the same feelings that everybody else has in certain situations, like, like this. I don't, have, I don't have anywhere near the same feelings that people out there have today. But they all felt like this. It's not just you. Amen. It's not just me. It's everyone. There were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. If you feel this way, you're doing it right. That's, good. That's what it means. It can be, look, and you can be an incredible blessing on future generations if you so choose. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Turn to Luke chapter 1. And look at verse number 50. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 50. The Bible reads, And His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. Look, that's why, do you see, a, do you see a, a, a clause in there? Does it say that his mercy is just on everyone no matter what? It says, no, his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Do you see why Moses and all these, these, these men were just crying out constantly to the children of Israel saying, you have to fear the Lord even when I'm gone. Even when I'm gone, you have to follow these laws. Because once you stop fearing the Lord, all bets are off. That's why Moses said it. Joshua said it. All, they all said it over and over and over. So as you read the Bible, you're like, man, you just said it two, two pages ago. 
Why didn't they listen? But we don't listen either. So you see that that is the, the catch. That to those, that, those generations that fear the Lord, you know, that will be a great blessing. That's what you can pass on. We'll talk about that more in tonight's sermon. Number three, your seed, let's look at Sarah. Your seed will bless the world, literally, the Bible says. Your seed through your testimony, through your life, can be a blessing to the entire world. Think of it. Think of it. Sarah's son Isaac, he wasn't, he wasn't the sand of the seashore, was he? No. He was the first grain of sand. He wasn't the stars of the sky. He was the first star. But when you think about this whole thing, look back at Hebrews 11, uh, verse 12, or I'll just read it for you. Therefore sprang there even of one, talking about Sarah, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. That means you couldn't even count them. Couldn't even count them. Look, so it grew after the first generation. It grew more, and it grew more, and it grew more. It's called, it's called uh, an exponential growth. Right? We've seen a lot of that lately. But it's called exponential growth. Children have children, have children, have children, have children. I mean, look, that's a force multiplier if it's done properly. You know, you say, what's a force multiplier? Here's the definition of a force multiplier from the, from the dictionary. A capability that when added to and employed to a combat force, typically, significantly increases the combat potential of that force and thus enhances the probability of success of a successful mission accomplishment. Some examples of, of force multipliers in military history were like machine guns, right? Where they went from, you know, just regular um, rifles to, you know, a, a, a single shot rifle to a semi-automatic rifle to a machine gun. That, those are force multipliers, right? The airplane, that, would, that was a force multiplier. Like if you had a bunch of guys over here and a bunch of the same size guys over here and they all started fighting, but these guys had an airplane, done. It's not even close, right? Helicopter, same thing. Look, having, that's the thing about church plants, right? That's the thing about church plants. I mean, you can go out soul winning and you can be like, you know, I'm just going to go soul winning and soul winning and soul winning and we could be a soul winning church and we could grow and grow. But you know what a force multiplier would be for our church? It, you know, look, church growth is great. Having more people come in here is going to be great. But you know what a force multiplier is for our church? Is when we start training up men to go out and start other churches. Amen. That's when that exponential force multiplication happens. All right? That is the power of this generational blessing. That's the power. Your generations, your, look, I'm talking about your generations that come after you. Your personal generations can be force multipliers for the world. You say, why? Because kids have kids. And then those kids have kids. And then you'll have grandkids and great grandkids. And then when you're dead, there'll be more kids and more generations and more generations. So if you can kind of figure out a way to make sure that that fear of the Lord passes to your next generation and the next generation and the next generation, you'll have a force multiplier on your hands from your family for the gospel. Amen. And you say, well, how do we do that? Well, the Bible tells you how to do it. Amen. I mean, just listen, right? I mean, we're not up here, I'm not up here preaching the Bible on how to raise kids and raise godly kids just to, to waste time. I mean, this is the type of, of you know, look, it's a blessing to you. To not have bratty kids. To be able to watch your own children serve the Lord in their life. That's a blessing that you will receive on this earth, you yourself personally. But there's, but there's more. And there's something better for the world if you do it right. Amen. And you teach them to do it right for their children. You see? You see? I mean, that's awesome. If my kids grow up and... You know, those few kids that I have, they grow up and serve the Lord, that's great. That's a blessing to me. Amen. But if they grow up and they have a thousand other ancestors that all end up serving the Lord, that's a blessing on the world. Amen. That's better than the blessing that I had. Amen. 
You see? That's why those blessings that we might not see are better. And, the God, and God tells us that they're going to be better. So look, look. We go out soul winning. I mean, I love it, right? We go out soul winning, and, you know, the, the stupidest, craziest situations, we'll find a way to still go soul winning. It's awesome. We love it, right? We all love it. You could spend hours and hours and hours every week soul winning. But don't forget to raise that next generation right. Because that's the force multiplier. Right? So, you're one man. Don't forget, look, there's plenty of godly men and women that have lost their children and that, that has just, it just died with them. There's plenty. There's plenty in the Bible if you need b biblical examples. There's plenty that I can think of in this world. Godly men of God that were, were great preachers and great leaders, but for some reason, not with their family. So don't think it can't be you. So don't be this person that's just, you know, uh, you know, it's just soul winning for me personally. No, there's other, you, you, there's, there's, you, you have to pay attention and focus on your family. Because look, it'll be a blessing for you, but it'll be a huge blessing for future generations. If you do it right. And the Bible tells us how to do it right. So we have the directions. We have the manual, right? So, be well-rounded. Be well-rounded, folks. There's blessings for the world out there. So ultimately, we need to realize that anything in this life, folks, and, you know, a lot of, you know, this is kind of becoming clear for a lot of people. I think this might be one of the benefits of this situation. But any, any, anything in this life really can perish away. Amen. Right? Especially now. We need to not focus so much on the blessings that we will receive in our lives. But on the eternal blessings that God, you know, can, can give to future generations and ultimately, folks, from, you know, to the world. Just from us being here. Just from us being here and having that faith to do things according to the Bible. I mean, it said, by faith these men did these things. By faith these men did this. By faith Noah built the ark. By faith they, you know, by faith Abraham went to sacrifice a promise that he did receive. I mean, here, here he, he's like, I got one. Woo! I, I'm gonna, I, got, I got that one. I received that one. Now God's like, sacrifice it. He's like, oh, bummer. But he did it. He did it. I mean, that's faith. So if we have that faith, those blessings will be better for future generations. That's, hey, that's why there's an unbroken chain of Christians going all the way back to Christ. That's why. That's why it's not broken. Because those men who were getting, and, and women, who were getting no blessings, who were living horrible lives and dying horrible deaths, they just, they just had faith. They just had faith all the way to the end that the blessing just wasn't going to be for them in their time. That's it. So the blessing is for us as we read about them. And their what? Their testimony. Right? Look back at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Look, they didn't receive the promise. And here it is. I told you that there's something better, but it's not enough that I tell you. Look at verse number 40. So they didn't receive the promise. Verse number 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. That's why. Because no matter what we receive in this life, I don't think, look, I don't think there's, first of all, I don't think there's anyone in this room that could claim the life of the prophets. Even, you know, as messed up as things can get and all this kind of stuff, I don't think there's anybody in this room who can claim that they hasn't, haven't received blessings in their life. I mean, you have, you know, these, these people have suffered nothing but, some of them nothing but pain and rejection and suffering their whole life. 
You know, you have blessings. You know, tonight we'll talk about, you know, the fine line of how to handle those blessings in your life. We'll talk about that tonight. But in times where you think, man, you know, this is rough. You know, this is rough. You know, what's the, what's the payoff here? You know, what, what's, the, what's the benefit of, of this, you know, Christian life that I'm living right now? Because, look, I mean, do you have to come to church to be saved? I mean, do you have to live this separated Christian life to, to be saved? To go to heaven? No, you don't. You didn't remember that the prosperity gospel is not a, it's just fake. I hope and pray a lot that God blesses the lives of all of you. But it is very possible that these blessings that you have in your life, look, things come and go. I'm not that old. I'm kind of old. I'm 42. I've had, I've had good financial times and bad financial times in my life. Sometimes things are just working and sometimes they're not. That's just how it is. Amen. You just keep doing what you're supposed to do. By what? By faith. So look, the blessings you receive, may not, it, it, they may not be realized by you. That's, that's the whole point. I know I keep saying it over and over again, but I want to just drill that in. But what God has for you, what God has for us, what God has for future generations because of your faith, what God has for the world because of your faith that you have now is better than anything that you could get right now. You say, well, I just want it now. Well, you're selfish. I mean, God, I mean, think about these things. Think about just the blessings that could come from your faithful life. That's, that's, that's Hebrews chapter 11 right there. Your faithful life. And you know what? You eventually will realize those blessings because you'll be watching it from eternal life. Abraham saw it. He saw him going to the promised land. You know, Abraham knows all the blessings that came from his life. He saw that the Messiah came from him. He saw all these things. You'll see it. It just won't be in this tiny little blip of your physical life right here. It'll be somewhere in the eternity of your life. And guess what? It's going to be much better. That's why Hebrews 11 is, is such a great chapter. It tells you, you know, it explains faith, and then it tells you the benefit of it. It tells you the power of it. It tells you, you know, this faith that you have now, don't just sit there and say, well, I'm having all this faith, and I'm doing all these things, and where's all the stuff coming to me? You're setting yourself up for failure. You know, that, look, look, that sells books, right? That sells books. You know, your perfect life now, or whatever the stupid book is, right? Your wonderful business now or whatever read the bible six times a day and you i don't even know but i mean it sells people want to hear it it tickles the ears telling people that look you know first of all am i really up here telling you that look you're gonna have you need to have faith you need to have strong faith and your life is gonna stink it's gonna be terrible no that's not really it, it might be but there's there's something better coming there's something better. And that's why you can have that faith. Because God promises you that if you don't receive it now, you'll see it later, and it will benefit the world. It will be much better than anything you could have gotten personally now. Amen. Through your generations and just through you know, the blessings that you can affect on the world. I mean, look, that's powerful. That's exciting, right? Are you telling me that I, you know, who I am right now can affect the world? Yes. I'm telling that you, your faith, can affect the entire world. Like the sand of the sea. Think about it. But it depends on how you do things now. It depends on your testimony. It depends on your works, right? It depends on your works. Not to get to heaven, but how you'll bless the world, how you'll bless those future generations. Amen. So works do matter in this sense. You know, you're, that's why you're, look, that's why also your faith and your works are tied together like that. Amen. Because as those two, you know, as your faith gets stronger, you know, through your works, now, you know, that's how your faith is made perfect. 
that will just project itself out more. But you may not see it personally. You'll see it eventually, though. Guaranteed. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, Hebrews chapter 11. What a great chapter in the Bible. We thank you for um, all these wonderful promises, Lord, in the Bible that you've given to us, that even though we may not realize these promises now, Lord, we understand that, you know, we just by faith believe these promises, Lord. We believe that what you say is true, and, you know, we have that hope and that faith of, of the things that we don't need to see, Lord. And we just know that your word is true, and we thank you that we're able to hold it in our hands. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.